Hi, I'm Benton Stokes. And I'm Elaine O'Rourke. And this is Cocktail Theology. Hi there. Hi there. <laughs> Here we are in beautiful Truckee, California. We are in beautiful Truckee, California. Yeah, up in the Sierra Nevadas. We're near Lake Tahoe. This is the first time I've ever been in this part of California. Uh, it's really beautiful. So we came up to Truckee in order to get some cocktail theology done. Yeah. Because we have been doing other things. So why don't you tell the people what else is going on if you want to right now? Oh, yeah. So we're doing this series of episodes in in Truckee. And of course, this is uh, September of 2020. So we are still in the midst of a pandemic that has kept us kind of locked down. Things are different in different parts of the country, different parts of the world. But right now in California, uh, there are still some pretty stringent restrictions as to uh, what we can do, where we can go, and how we are to behave among other people. So uh, we as Elaine said, wanted to get away and focus on recording a few episodes uh, because this has been a year full of uh, scary distractions. And there are things that we want to talk about. There are things that you all have told us that you would like us to talk about. So we wanted to spend a little time and energy on that. And that's why we're here. But uh, there are currently fires also happening uh, all up and down the West Coast. And Oregon right now uh, is, is in the thick of it. Many thousands of people evacuated from their homes, and uh, and California has uh, has broken records for the number of acres burned, particularly this early in the fire season. It's just uh, it's highly unusual. So we have those threats. Other parts of the country have had terrible hurricanes, uh, terrible tornadoes. Don't know how you could live on the planet right now and and not see the effects of climate change all around. Uh, But what we decided we would talk about in this episode is something that one of our listeners brought to us, talking about uh, the current American elections uh, between Donald Trump, our incumbent president, and uh, the challenger Democrat Joe Biden. Okay, I just pictured them both in satin trunks. I know, and that's not something you phrased, really want to look at. But the way you at. phrased it, it was suddenly, I was suddenly in the boxing ring, and I was ding, like... Ding, ding, <laughs> yeah, Exactly. Well, we've been in a season of, of, of divisiveness in our country for longer than four years. Yes. Um, but, but definitely, uh, it has become more amplified, more obvious in the last four years. And so this election is particularly, gosh, I don't even have the right adjective for it, but the, the, the rancor and the name calling and the accusations and the flat out uh, made up stuff that's, that's, that's coming out in the news every day is exhausting. So one of our listeners brought this question what as Christians are we to do when we feel that our government doesn't represent us? Now, when I'm saying us as Christians, I'll qualify that in a minute. Our government doesn't represent us. We aren't seen. We aren't taken seriously. And it creates a sense of fear, particularly among Christians that aren't evangelicals, Christians that do not support this president, so what are we to do if this president's reelected? And the other part of this question is, how invested is God in this election? Does God have a dog in this fight? Besides putting the dog in satin trunks, <laughs> because now I've got God's dog <laughs> and Donald Trump and Joe Biden in the ring together. <laughs> For me, I need to make a couple of clarifications yeah, let's do that. in what we just said. Let's do that. I am right now internally struggling with the notion of us as Christians, that phrase, us mm-hmm. as Christians. Mm-hmm. I think that the challenge that we face, and we talked about this in, in the earlier episode we recorded, yes. the challenge that we face is we can have the label of Christian and not have the life that is focused on God. Yes, exactly. 
So the question that we're asking right now, I believe, is not what should people with the label of Christians respond, although that's part of it, Mm -hmm. but part of it, and I would say most of it, is for those of us who want to live a life that is focused on God and loving neighbor, then what? Then what? Right? Right. So I want to do that. And the other piece that I need to state, and I, I think you agree with me on this, but feel free to say that you don't. I I really need to say that the protests and the the loudness and the social unrest is not a cause of divisiveness. It no. is a outcome it is. of divisiveness. Absolutely. And it is an outcome of hundreds of years of flat-out slavery, ongoing oppression, deliberate and intentional sidelining of people who don't look like they came from Northern Europe. Yes. And and this is the predictable outcome yes. of this. So I, I just really want to lift that up, that when we're talking about feeling threatened or feeling afraid, we're not talking about we are afraid of those black people out there who are now tearing up Detroit, right? Mm-hmm. Please hear the sarcasm in my voice. Yes. Um, we're not saying that. Not at all. And I just want to be really clear about that right up front. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because Christians, in big scare quotes, are really afraid of all those black people out there. <laughs> right. Right? And, yes. that's the, and, that, and that's the problem. Yes. Yes. Right? That's, that's the, the problem. That is the problem. Yeah. And and you're right. Using using the descriptor Christian right now is is tough. Um, we we did an episode a couple of years ago about this, about the watering down of the of the term Christian and how you don't know what that means anymore. And by you, I mean anybody, especially people who aren't Christians. Right. So yeah, it it, it actually doesn't serve us to use that term. I think what the way that you put it, people who are actually seeking God in the way of Jesus, those are the people who are feeling most threatened by the results of what this election could mean. Yeah. Apart from those of minority groups and those of oppressed groups and those of, you know. And understanding those are overlapping categories. Those are all overlapping categories. Right. So does God care about this election? Is God invested in this? Well, God is invest is invested in this insofar as God cares about how we treat one another. And God is much more invested in how we love or don't love each other than any political system, any financial system, any method of government. One of the very troubling things that I've seen leading into the last election and what we've seen during this four years is how a certain group of Christians conflate America and Christianity and God and Trump and get real self-righteous about this is what God would want. This is what God, it's like trying to speak for God or trying to trying to insinuate that Jesus would wave an American flag and would you know, support the policies of, of our president. I've also heard that, you know, obviously God uh, wanted Trump to be president, that Trump was somehow prophesied that somehow Trump I'm sorry. is. Sorry, <laughs> that one is so hard it's, for me not to laugh I, at. Yeah. Because it's because, oh my goodness gracious, that one, <laughs> that one, I like, like, I, I can, I can go sort of with the other ones. I can kind of go with the, you know, no one gets elected without God's hand in it. Mm-hmm. I, I don't buy it, but I can go with mm-hmm. that. But prophesied by whom? By whom? <laughs> right. Right. Well, Will Jr. prophesied, <laughs> and we know what, and he's coming too. I mean, you know, this is, I mean, uh, golly. Yeah. There, we have taught, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to rant for a second. <laughs> no, please. This is where I need to rant. You know, as we pointed out in the car on the way up here, mm-hmm. there have really only been two kind of <laughs> big prophecies in the Bible, right? Yeah. One was Jesus. One was the Antichrist. Yes. And unless you think Trump is Jesus, and if you do, we have, like, I, I do counseling. <laughs> um, but 
Th- those are your options. Those are your options. Okay. So, so unless you want Trump to be either Jesus or the Antichrist, you need to back off the prophesy thing. Yeah. Because that's just caca. Yeah. It's okay. <sighs> All right. I'm fine now. Now we can go right. and ask legitimate questions right. about it. This election is really troublesome because the biggest part of Trump's support base is people who profess to be Christians. What I know from talking to them uh, is that they really do believe that Trump being president is ushering in a new age, uh, that it's ushering in the second coming of Jesus, that it's ushering in the tribulation, the tribulation. Well, I mean, I guess I guess you could argue we're in tribulation because well, God knows we've got plagues and fires and national natural disasters and mm-hmm. unrest and. Mm-hmm. But if but if we're going to be ushering in the the second coming, then we need to understand by this way of thinking about Christianity and by this really really flawed reading of Revelation mm-hmm. that if in fact we think that's what's happening, then he has also ushered in the tribulation. Yes, and and if you think I'm sorry, if you think that everything that's going on right now is really a good thing, then you need to back off of destroying the rest of us. Uh Because if it's a good thing, you don't need to do anything about it. Uh Right? Anyway, yeah. It's it's bonkers. Um, (laughs) And and it's really difficult. I grew up in a fundamentalist church, and, and and I get some of this end time stuff, but it's not, it's not in the Bible. Um, none of this is supported by any sane view of God. When you are part of an of a group that's outside, say you're a gay Christian, or say you are a black Christian, or say you are an immigrant Christian, or an or a gay immigrant black Christian. Exactly. What does that mean for you? All we're really talking about are white evangelical Christians. Can I add to that, please? So evangelical is a political designation that was started by Jerry Falwell and the moral majority. Mm -hmm. I want to be really, really, really clear about that. The notion that evangelical actually has anything to do with one's views about God and Jesus are accidental at this point. Yes. It is a political right. movement. It is a, yes, absolutely. Okay. So let's be very clear that when evangelicals as a political movement say they want X, Y, Z, they are speaking in exactly the same way as Republicans who say they want X, Y, Z, or Democrats who say they want X, Y, Z, or Libertarians who say they want X, Y, Z. They're not part of a party. They are a political movement. Now, often that political movement finds an uncomfortable but ready home in the Republican Party. But it is not what it means to be a Republican, necessarily. So so be very clear, evangelical is a political movement. I think it's helpful to say that evangelicals as a political movement support the re-election of Donald Trump. Once we understand that it's a political movement, then the question of Christian or not Christian goes away. Goes away. Exactly. No, that's a great way to think about it. Because then we don't have to qualify, well, they're really this kind of Christian or whatever. Because that's not what's going on here. This is not about their views of God, although I think one can extract their views of God from their political positions. Yes. But that's not what's going on. It's not not that Christians think Donald Trump is the second coming. Right. It's that evangelicals as a political movement find their best outcomes in someone who behaves in this way. Yes. Now, that's terrifying to me. It is. But it's less terrifying than people who claim to love God want to destroy everyone else. Right. And I think in the beginning, when Trump was elected and the media was grappling with, number one, how did this happen? And number two, why are Christians voting for him? A lot of it was the media 
taking that turn because they needed to distill which Christians, quote unquote Christians, are we talking about here? Because in the beginning, it was really exhausting having to exclude this group and exclude that group and exclude that group. And what we really mean is this group. So then evangelical became this tent term for people who support what Trump's agenda promotes. Right. Well, and also people who go to church. And evangelical. Also people, right. And also people who go to church. And these people are, by and large, white, anti-choice, not pro-gay, mm-hmm. not necessarily pro-women either. They are people who read the Bible very literally, and in some cases probably worship the Bible, as we talked about in our last episode. And shallowly. And very shallowly, right. They use the Bible to support their positions. Right. Defining that group may or may not be helpful, but for the purposes of our conversation, evangelicals, that's what we mean. So what does that mean for those of us who are not evangelicals, but we are followers of God in the way of Jesus? What does that mean for us? Right. We're living in this kingdom using that deliberately because Trump has been elevated to a position that's not unlike a king because he's been given so much authority, so much power, and no one's keeping him in check. So when his policies are so anti what people who follow God in the way of Jesus believe and support and espouse and actually behave in the way of, then what are we to do with that? How do we, how do we behave in an America that is antagonistic toward us? Love that phrasing because it is a political culture that is antagonistic towards loving God and neighbor. Yes. And if you're Jewish, you're also called to love God and neighbor because yes. that's where we get it. It isn't right. like we developed that whole idea. <laughs> right. 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 And I would argue that, that that's true for other groups as well, but I can speak to those two comfortably. I want to tease out a couple more things that you said, and Mm -hmm. you started to really hit on it on the thing that I think is important towards the end there. So two things. One is, as thoughtful people, we always have to ask ourselves, are we worshiping somebody instead of God? Mm -hmm. And one of the things we teach in our courses is that as, as followers of Jesus, people who want to keep looking at God and understanding God, we have to start from the idea that we should never believe anything bad about God. And the reason we start from that idea is because there is nothing bad about God. God is good. It's not we shouldn't think. It's that God is wholly good. So that's why we say that. If there is somebody about whom you can say, there is nothing that would get me to change my opinion, then you are worshiping that person. Mm -hmm. I want to be very clear about that. If you are coming into this where there's nothing that would change your opinion about Joe Biden, then you are worshiping Joe Biden. Mm, If you are coming into this that there's nothing that anyone could say that would make you think poorly of Donald Trump, then you are worshiping Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And as people of faith, regardless of what we're doing, regardless of what we're talking about, we have to be very strict with ourselves about whom we worship. Yes. So... The challenge has been that the people who worship Donald Trump have aligned themselves with a worship of God, which is just simply, you can't do both. You can't worship both. It doesn't work. They've also aligned themselves with hating everybody else in the world. Mm -hmm. Like this whole America first idea, Mm -hmm. A, means nobody else matters, but B, it ignores the fact that, that we are actually part of the world. Yes, right. I mean, really actually part of the world. Yeah. Right? Okay, so there's that. The other piece is, if we take the Bible seriously, if we read it as though it matters, then we we need to look at what the Bible says about kings. Now, there were kings that God blessed, Mm -hmm. but God didn't want kings to begin with. God tried to get Israel to understand The kings were a bad thing. God spent many books of the Bible saying, (laughs) please don't have a king. Kings are really not a good idea. I cannot tell you how stupid having a king is. I mean, I think God says that somewhere in like, you know, but 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 God didn't want us to have kings. God allowed the people of Israel to set up a king 
because God knew that they weren't going to rest until they had a king like every other culture in the world. Okay? We wanted what every other culture had. We wanted the consistency of somebody who told us what to do and we didn't have to think. Mm. Okay? That's why we got kings. And then in the long list of kings of Israel that happened after that, there are some who tried to be in touch with God and God blessed that. Mm -hmm. There are some who were evil and raped the country and destroyed the people and were arrogant and haughty Mm -hmm. and all of those things, Mm -hmm. right? Right. God did not bless them. They They weren't kings because God had blessed them. They were kings because we love our kings. Mm. We love to not have to think at all and to invest our who we are in somebody else's power. We love being one step away from the seat of power. Mm -hmm. So so there's that. If you're going to read the Bible, you need to understand God does not love kings. The other thing that is very clear in the Bible, and if you idolize the Bible, you really need to understand this. (laughs) Yeah. There is one king. One, period, Mm -hmm. who matters. And it's not any earthly king or earthly president or earthly, you know, company owner. There's one king. We serve one king. And that is God. God is king. Mm -hmm. And if we allow any human being to take the place of God in our worship, if we are so invested in our relationship with an earthly ruler of any kind, then just pick up your Bible and throw it in the trash because you have no idea what it says and you've never read it. So I'm done now. (laughs) And I don't care who that king is. I mean, I truly don't care who that king is. Right. This, This is an extreme, extreme statement, okay? But if you think that the creator of Star Wars is the most brilliant person ever and you could never say anything bad about that person, you are worshiping a king. Okay? So it doesn't matter who the king is. Right. It doesn't matter if it's your, 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 your romantic partner. If there's nothing that could make you think that perhaps that person is flawed in some way, mm-hmm. you worship that person. And God wants worship of God only. That's why God didn't want kings. Because there is one king. Now I think I'm done with my rant. <laughs> oh, it just makes me insane. Yeah. It, it just, it, it's so obvious they've never actually read the Bible. Ever. No, they haven't. They pull out things that support their positions. And, and then they use them. They weaponize them sometimes against people who don't believe they, the way they do. Right. Or even people who do, but live somewhat differently. Yeah, right. Right? I mean, that's why evangelicalism as a political movement, as opposed to a religious uh, position, is so important. Because evangelicals who are part of the political movement hate many of the evangelicals who are part of the religious view. Yes. Because they don't agree. If you are a Christian and you want this man or any man To have all the power of a king, you need to get rid of that word because you are not a Christian. You are a whomeverin. Then the question is, once we set that group of people aside for the moment, the rest of us Mm -hmm. who are, are, you know, mostly blindly trying to figure out how to manage all of this, and occasionally we get some light and can kind of see our way onto a path and kind of get the rest of us, we're the ones who have to grapple with what do we do? How do we live? How do we understand a political system Mm -hmm. that is not, no matter what anybody says, it's not founded in religious systems. It's not founded on God. It's a political system and it's it's an economic system that we have decided is the one we want to follow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Crony capitalism rules the world. Right. So, but we've decided that's what we want for now. So. Given that we live in that system, how do we behave? How do we respond? How do we take action? How do we get out in front of those who want to destroy the people we want to protect? And for me, the people I want to protect always are the people to whom the law is not a friend, 
to whom the social structures are not friends, who do not have the safety net underneath them. Right. These are the people I want to protect right. because I am more protected by the safety net. I am more yes. protected by the legal structures. And I want them to be protected and cared for in, as well. So how do I get out in front of the hordes, which are actually pretty small, but they're very loud and very vicious and very unthinking. Mm -hmm. How do I get out in front of the hordes that want to destroy those people I want to protect? Right. That is the question that, is the question. that our listeners actually ask. We have to do this right. To be somebody's life. First, I have to decide whether I've got any other king besides God. Once I get there, then I can go ahead and start to love my neighbor properly. Because if my security is my king, I will not love my neighbor properly. If fear is my king, I will not love my neighbor properly. Who is my king? Whom do I worship? Which is what we were talking about in the mm -hmm. last episode. Mm -hmm. So those are the questions we have to ask as people of faith, no matter what faith we are, as long as our faith isn't Trumpism or fearism or whatever. Right. As people of faith, the first question is, whom do I worship? And on behalf of whom am I acting? Right. When voting is a means of establishing judges, and I'm using that very mm -hmm. deliberately, um, not kings, judges, judges. leaders, when voting is that, am I willing to vote what against what seems to be my best option? Am I willing to vote against my own interests? Because if we are not willing to vote against our own interests, then we do not care about our neighbors as ourselves, period. Right. If my interests are more important than my neighbor's interests, I do not love my neighbor as I love myself, period. Mm -hmm. So we have to be at least willing. We have to believe that there is something good and holy about truly loving, willing the good of our neighbors enough to say, no, you know what? I actually make enough money or whatever the case is. Mm -hmm. So that's the second thing I think that we have to do as people of faith. The first thing is ask, whom do we worship? Mm -hmm. The second is on, you know, on behalf of whom are we living? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And that question is, am I willing to give up some of what I have? Which seems completely antithetical to what's going on in this political movement that we're calling evangelical because it is what can I get? What can I keep? That's a lot of it is the, the, the perception that uh, rights are being ceded over, you know, somehow by letting a same sex couple get married is somehow cheapens marriage for, for a straight couple or by uh, making sure that, women are paid the same as men in the workplace, that men are somehow having something taken away from them. Well, and, and like in the, in, the, in the battle over universal health care, the idea that if I help pay for someone else's health care, it's going to damage my health care or it's going to damage what I have. And the problem is, is the people who often, not always, the people who don't want to pay for somebody else's health care don't have health care. Right. They don't have it. So they don't want me Mm -hmm. who, who is capable of contributing to their health care. Mm -hmm. They don't want me doing that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they would rather not have health care mm -hmm. than have me contribute to somebody else's health care. It, 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 it is mind-boggling to me. It is mind-boggling. And so sometimes I have to vote on their behalf. Yeah. Right? Sometimes I have to vote for universal health care that I pay into for the person who wants me to die on the streets. Mm-hmm. Because I have to, I need to love that person. Right. And loving that person means they get health care. Yeah. That's the challenge for people of faith. So that's the third question. Once I figured out who my kings are, once I figured out who is in my realm of neighbor, mm -hmm. then the next question is, and what do I do? And sometimes it is, I do things that do not seem to be in my best interest. I support people who hate me because it is the way I'm called to live. Yeah. And if the battle for equity disturbs you, if the loudness of black people disturbs you, 
If you feel as a white person that you are hated by black people, then the next question is, and how shall I serve them as a person of faith? If in fact you think people of color and immigrants and gay people and whatever, insert your group here, are your enemy, then your next step is, and how do I serve them? How do I love them as I love myself? Mm-hmm. We hate that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we hate it. It's hard. It's hard work. And it means we vote. And it means we do the best we can to support the people who are the least dishonorable among us. Mm-hmm. We question everything. We assume that everybody is flawed. And that some flaws, frankly, are worse than other flaws. Yes. I I personally think that someone who has five children from three different women, some of them being pregnant at the same time, has a problem with power without knowing anything else. Right. Then if I look at the policies and say, oh, and these policies are designed to hurt everyone except the person making them. That's a problem. That's a problem. I consider that more of a problem than foot in mouth disease. Mm-hmm. So that's where we have to come to. So that's kind of the fourth thing. What do we consider to be the flaws that cannot be ignored or the habits of behavior that cannot be ignored? Feel free to comment at any point. Yeah, Tell me I'm, I'm, thinking. <laughs> I'm thinking right now. Now you've said so many good things. I'm just like, my struggle hasn't been recently loving protesters or loving people who don't look like me or who don't think like me. But my problem has been evangelicals. And I think some of it is because I, I come out of that and I know they know better. Going back to the episode where we were talking about worship and the intoxication mm. and, and what you said about being one step removed from power. I, I feel like the evangelicals in my life and I have a lot of them in my family, they're intoxicated. Yes. Because they feel like, finally, there's somebody in there that's going to get those gays, that's going to put those blacks in their place, that's going to uphold Christian values, that's going to put judges in there that'll, that'll overturn Roe versus Wade, that'll you know, make America into this 1950s utopia that never really existed. I'm having a real hard time loving them. And I feel like, because they're, because they're not pro-gay either, I feel like that's just a direct assault on me as a person. And that's hard. And so the thing that I'm having to pray for is compassion for the evangelicals. How to love people who really are proving to be my enemy, even though they will tell me to my face that they love me. I think remembering what love is is helpful. Willing the good of another. Willing the good of another. And being willing to act for the good of another. And being humble about what we think is the good. Yes. Right. Right. That's a lot of it. That's a lot of it. That has not been my struggle, personally. My own struggle is against arrogance. Mm. As opposed to lack of love. I know better. Mm -hmm. I do think I know better in some cases. But Mm -hmm. I don't know better in all cases. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, And so being humble about that. Yeah, yeah, sure. I think the other question that people of faith, and, and this is where our interview with Michael Ray Matthews mm-hmm. is helps frame this for me, why, why his work and the work of faithful justice seekers has, has been so important for my own formation and for my understanding of what it means to love our neighbor. The question is, as a person of faith, who has a single king and understands that there is a single eternal kingdom. How do I participate? Do I participate? What is appropriate participation in what are earthly structures of politics and economics? Wow, that's a good question. So some people say, if I can't vote for either one, I shouldn't vote. Well, what you're doing then is you're, you are in fact voting for the louder person. Mm-hmm. In fact, that's what you're doing. And understanding that choosing to not vote for an earthly person of any whatever means you're also not voting for your king. 
because mm -hmm. we have to participate in order to help the people we are supposed to love. Yes. Right? First thing is, yeah, you have to be involved. As people of faith, we either need to live in complete solitude from all the structures of the world, which is not possible. <laughs> right. Okay? I don't care who you are. Can't do it. <laughs> right. Don't go into the woods and live off the grid because you're taking away six square feet of the woods from me. So you are participating. Right. We have to understand that we are part of a much larger world. When in Revelation, since these people like to lean on Revelation, when in Revelation, John looks out and sees not only the 12 tribes, but all and the nations. Everybody else. Uh -huh. All together all in the presence of God, having been brought into the presence of God. John is not saying, well, my little corner over here is really in the presence of God, and I don't know why those people showed up. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, so the question then is, how do we participate? What are better and worse ways to participate? And, and I'll be honest with you, I, I'm, I don't think there's a single good answer to that. Sometimes you are a marcher. There, mm -hmm. there have been long decades in my life where I was out on the streets doing that particular kind of work. That's not where I am now. I support it, but yeah. it's not where I am now. Yeah. I am much more interested in having conversations that shift hearts. Yes. Now, you can do both. Mm -hmm. I believe that's of one course. of the things that Michael Ray does very, very well, right. is both. But, you know, we're going to participate differently. I think that as people of faith, frankly, we're required to vote. Because it is one of the ways we can exercise love towards our neighbor. It is. You know? So, so those are the questions, right? How do I do this? How, how do I participate in a way that is loving? In a way that reflects the fact that I think that people are made in the image of God. And not just for the first nine months of their existence, but after right. that as well. After that as well, yes. So really, things that we can do presently, what we can do, certainly we can vote. If we aren't registered, registered to vote, there's still time to do that. We're in September. We can pray for the least of these. We can pray for our enemies, however we perceive our enemies. We can pray uh, for our leaders. We can pray for the Holy Spirit to move in the way she moves that we don't understand but hearts get changed and minds get changed and things happen that are outside of the realm of our understanding sometimes. And we can pray for that. I think those are things that we can do. And then where there is opportunity to have a conversation, to march, to give, to show up, to share or promote in your socials, to write a letter. Um, to wear a mask. To wear, yes, thank you, to wear a mask, where there's opportunity to do that and to demonstrate love for someone else in a tangible way like that, we should do those things. Yep. And we all have opportunities to do those things. All of us. All of us, in our own unique ways. Yep. So we all touch different people. Yep. Even if you never leave the house, you can do some of these things. Yes. Right. And I think it does help to understand and to recognize, just recognize, that we currently live in an America that is antagonistic toward us. Yep. And when you recognize that, you can take that posture and you can know that, okay, well, I'm going to face opposition when I do these things sometimes. Adding one more thing. Yeah. I am thinking about the passage in, in the epistles about putting on the breastplate yes. of righteousness, the helmet yes. of all of those things. Every single thing we are called to put on is defensive rather than offensive. Mm -hmm. Understanding that that is our job, that we will be attacked, and continuing to speak for love and justice and mercy and kindness and forgiving of oneself and for voting against one's own interests sometimes, at least short-term interests sometimes, mm -hmm. Those are the things we are called to do as people of faith. Indeed. Thanks, folks, for listening. We really do appreciate you tuning in to the things that uh, are in our hearts and minds. And we want to reflect what's on your heart and your mind. So 
please let us know. Uh, you can find us on all the socials. You can drop us an email, either Elaine, E-L-A-N-E, or Benton, B-E-N-T-O-N, at schoolforseekers.com. Uh, we do pay attention, uh, oh, and we will respond. So uh, let us know if there's something that's on your heart, something you'd like to hear us talk about. Question, it can be deep, it can be not deep. <laughs> We also like to talk about cocktails. We didn't today, <laughs> but we probably will in the next episode, I'm guessing. So <laughs> It's almost noon, right? <laughs> we love you guys. Thank you for listening. Bye. Thanks. Bye. <laughs>